just started the recording. Again, want to thank the folks from Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services that are here providing ASL translation as well as our closed captioning. And again, we're recording this uh, so that it could be accessible later. Today, we're going to be talking about accessibility and fair housing. And there's so much that goes into accessibility and fair housing. Uh, so much that uh, we're not going to be able to get through all of it today. What these Empower uh, Hours are designed to do is actually provide a very broad look, a 30,000 foot view of some of the subject matter to provoke interest, to provoke questions, uh, also to figure out what in, in detail you want to learn about this subject. And there's not a lot that goes on, not a lot about uh, accessibility that gets talked about uh, because there, it is uh, very much full of talking about measurements and standards and, and those kinds of things, but it is very much ingrained in the Fair Housing Act, uh, especially uh, as, as it was amended in 1988. So we wanna make sure that we at least cover the basic framework of, uh, of this today. Let's see here, advance the slides. As you know, fair housing in Pennsylvania is, is a right, right? It is a right that you have under the law. Uh, even though we have the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act, we also subscribe to the Fair Housing Act, which is the federal code. So here's our goals for today. Today, we're going to talk about the Fair Housing Act and other laws that require accessible designs. Okay? Uh, let me admit all these folks that require uh, accessible designs in well, Pennsylvania. Funny. Once again, I'll ask that if you are not uh, participating, that you please mute. Uh, out of respect for all those that are trying to listen. Plus, you don't want to hear people say things you don't want to say. <laughs> um, so the other goal that we have uh, for today's webinar is to review the types of buildings and dwellings that are covered. And then we're also going to discuss disability types. Um, it, it's important to know uh, the different disability types that are going to be considered when looking at designs. Uh, we're going to provide a brief overview of the Fair Housing Accessibility Requirements. Very brief overview because, uh, as I said, it is a uh, rabbit hole that we could go into and spend the rest of the afternoon on. But we're going to give you a top line view of it. Uh, if you leave this webinar wanting more, that's a good thing. I will remind you also that at the end of the webinar, once it shuts down, there's going to be a survey that pops up uh, right at the, its automatic pop up. If you wouldn't mind taking that survey and responding to all the questions on that survey because it will ask what other uh, trainings you'd be interested in you know how much information we provided whether it was too much information not enough information and all of this allows us to make more intuitive trainings when we are uh, putting these together right and then obviously the most important part of our goals is to answer your fair housing questions at the end and so i i will try not to bloviate uh, and to bore you to tears uh, as we talk about this uh, very important information. And for those of you that are that are here from the enforcement space and you are already doing uh, accessible design um, and going out and actually being on site and doing measurements, you know, when we get to the questions and answer and you want to impart some of your knowledge and what you've learned and what you've seen out in the field, uh, feel free to do so. Okay, come on. So beginning with law uh, and uh, regulations, obviously, that govern this, and I apologize for my typo on the top there. We all know who PHRC is. And, and if you're here and you're new and you don't know who PHRC is, we are the leading civil rights enforcement entity uh, in the Commonwealth. Uh, and our jurisdiction is pretty much across the Commonwealth. We have three regional offices, one in Pittsburgh, one in Harrisburg, one in Philadelphia. But as to the laws and regulations that govern uh, accessible design, you have the Architectural Barriers Act of 1968. This act stipulates that all buildings other than non-privately owned residential facilities constructed by or on behalf of or leased by the United States or buildings financed in whole or in part by the United States must be physically accessible for people with disabilities. The Uniform Federal Accessibility Standards, UFAS, is the applicable standard. Then you have the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Under the um, 
504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 as amended, no otherwise qualified individual with a disability may be discriminated against in any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. And the purpose of the 504 is to eliminate discriminatory behavior towards people with disabilities and to provide physical accessibility, thus ensuring that people with disabilities have the same opportunities in federally funded programs as do the people without disabilities, okay? So you have section 504 and those of us that are in the enforcement space, we're used to this, we know exactly what that is. We know that there's a 504 representative at most of the housing authorities that look at disability, uh, uh, reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications on a regular basis. On to other laws, you have the Fair Housing Act of 1968 as amended in 1988 as well. Fair Housing Act provides equal opportunity for people in the housing market regardless of disability, race, color, sex, religion, familial status, or national origin, regardless of whether the housing is publicly funded or not. This includes the sale, rental, and financing of housing, as well as the physical design of newly constructed multifamily housing. Now, what's important here is you notice it says, regardless of whether they receive federal funding or not. That is because the Section 504 is specifically for federally funded uh, housing. So you, you want to make sure that you know that that's the, uh, that's the linchpin, the difference between those two. And then you have the American with Disabilities Act of 1990. The Americans with Disabilities Act is a broad civil rights law guaranteeing equal opportunity for individuals with disabilities in employment, public accommodation, transportation, state and local government services, and telecommunications. Title III of the Act covers all private establishments and facilities considered public accommodations, such as restaurants, hotels, retail establishments, doctor's office, and theaters, and the list goes on. Not an exhaustive list, so. Talk a little bit about the types of buildings and dwellings covered. The Fair Housing Act covers most types of housing, right? And we all know that the PEHRA uh, considers uh, buildings that are, uh, some of you still have your, are unmuted, so make sure you do mute. Um, you know, the, the PHRA also uh, sees buildings that are intended for occupancy use. Uh, so think of this as kind of an interchanging definition. Most types of housing in some circumstances exempts owner occupied buildings with no more than four units, single family housing sold or rented without the use of a broker and housing operated by organizations and private clubs that limit occupancy to its members though, even though they limit occupancy to its members, they cannot limit the occupancy based on another protected class. So let's take a religious organization, for example. Uh, they may say, well, we have this building, it's called the Baptist uh, Church Apartments, and it's for Baptists only, but then you can't say Baptist female only or Baptist male only. Uh, the design and construction requirements of the Fair Housing Act and the guidelines apply only to new construction of housing built for first occupancy after March 13th, 1991. Okay, so new construction of housing built for first occupancy after March 13th, 1991. And we'll move on to the next slide. So here's some uh, disability types. Obviously you have mobile disability, so that category includes people who use a wheelchair and those who use other mobility aids. So the minimum clear floor space required uh, for some of the mobile mobility um, in a wheelchair or some other uh, use uh, of, of a mobile device is 30 by 48, 30 inches by 48 inches. And then the minimum turning space or what they call the turning radius is a minimum of 60 inches. So just to give you an idea, when they're looking at accessible design for those with mobile disability, these are the tolerances that they're looking at. Now there are organizations, and I'm, I, I recall English, uh, English Housing out of Philadelphia, they, uh, they do the ADA plus, that's, that's their philosophy, which means what we like to do is we like to look at the minimum requirements and see if we can't go a little beyond that. Because these things are always changing. Technology is also always changing. 
And so they wanna prepare for future adjustment. Then you have ambulatory mobility disability, right? So these individuals are using crutches and or walkers, some kind of device. And so there's a minimum space required for adults using crutches or walker. And that's 31 to 32.5 inches, okay? So that takes into account not only the legs and, and the mobility, but also the span of the crutches, All right? And then you have visual disability. Minimum space required for a person with a service animal is 32 inches, right? So 32 inches so that a person with a service animal, that is a C9 dog or somebody that's helping with mobility is 32 inches. You have the hearing disability. Uh, people with partial hearing often use a combination of speech and reading and hearing aids, which amplify the available sounds. Echo, reverberation, extraneous background noise can distort hearing, uh, hearing aid and, and transmission. So if you've ever gone to places that have, have a interior cinder block wall, you know how echoey that is. You know, they, they put block filler in it to try and deaden the noise, and then they put some epoxy on it as a paint, but it's still pretty echoey. And so in many places, you'll see that they've, they've put in uh, some form of artwork, tapestry on the walls that deadens the sound. Because if you have issues with hearing and you're getting this, this abundance of sound, if you're using a, a, a hearing aid, then you're... It, the hearing aid isn't doing any good because it's giving you more than what you need. And so it's, it's, uh, it's necessary. And in some places it's been used as a, as a reasonable accommodation for individuals with hearing to be able to actually, uh, the reasonable accommodation would be to put on some tapestry to deaden the sound or artwork to deaden the sound uh, from the echo that comes from the cinder block wall. So, so things to think about as you go through. Uh, once more, I'll, I'll ask that if you are not participating, that you do mute uh, while we have the webinar going on. Thank you so much. And then you have cognitive, cognitive disabilities and other hidden conditions. People with cognitive and learning disabilities may have difficult, difficulty using facilities, particularly when the signage system is unclear or complicated. In addition to people with permanent disabilities, there are others who may have temporary conditions which affect their usual abilities. So that's something to, to, to talk about. And I know that right, when we talk about the reasonable accommodation or reasonable modification, and one of the things that is considered, well, how long have they been disabled? Doesn't really come into play. There are people that are going to have temporary disabilities that are going to need a reasonable accommodation or a reasonable modification and under the law it must be given. So in case there's any questions to that effect. <clears throat> so, the the question is always well how do how do people uh, enforce or how do they get to enforce the uh, design requirements and for that under the Fair Housing Act there are two provisions that are designed to protect individuals with disability and the provision is reasonable accommodation is one so re it's a provision that allows an individual with a disability to request a change adjustment to the rules, policy, practices, and services when necessary to allow the resident with a disability equal opportunity to use the property and its amenity. Right? So allowing the individual to use uh, the property and its amenities, the same as anyone else would, that would not need a reasonable accommodation. Right? It's about opportunity and access. The second uh, provision is the reasonable modification pr provision, which makes it unlawful to refuse to permit residents with disabilities to make a structural change to either their dwelling unit or the public and common use areas at the resident's cost to allow equal opportunity to use the property and its amenities. So what's an example that, that would apply here in terms of being able to use a common use area. So it may be that uh, a building may require a ramp. Right? The building, it's an entrance everyone uses, but it doesn't have a ramp. And therefore, the tenant can ask to put a ramp in at their request. That is something that should not be uh, denied. Right? Pardon me. Right? So that those 
those are the two provisions that protect individuals with disabilities in order for them to be able to enjoy their dwelling as if they were individuals that would not require that accommodation. So what can a housing provider require in terms of, okay, if I'm going to allow this, what can I, what can I say, what can I do? So the modification may, they can require that the modification be made by a professional and in accordance with applicable building code. They can ask that. They can say, sure, you know, you, you can go ahead and do that, but make sure you use somebody that's licensed and insured and, and can, can get the job done. Because then if something happens, you know, there's a liability factor. I'm sure that that's one of the concerns, but also there's a safety factor for the individual with a disability. Want to make sure that it's not, you know, you don't want a baker making your ramp, no matter how good he might be at uh, making a ramp, right? Um, they also can condition, they, they can condition the permission on the resident agreeing to restore the modification to its original condition when the resident vacates the unit. So they could easily come up and say, well, you know, if I could have that back to the way it was before it was modified, that would be great. I would like to have that. You know, are you able to, to set some money aside to ensure that that, 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 that that does happen. And so those are the, some of the things that the, that the uh, pardon me, that the uh, housing provider can do. There's a question that always comes up and it comes up from property management, uh, property management and landlords and housing providers. You know, who pays for this modification? A housing provider that receives federal funding is required to provide and pay for the structural modification as a reasonable accommodation unless it amounts to undue financial and administrative burden or a fundamental alteration of the program. What does that mean? Well, quite simply, it means that if they're receiving federal funding, they've got to pay for it. Okay? The housing provider must pay for it. Uh, so we go back to that regulation 504 uh, Rehabilitation Act of 1973. That's that's where it's designed. That's where that lives. Right? Pardon me. I keep getting some notifications on my. There we go. Um, so there's there's that, and then undo uh, financial and administrative burden. How do we define that? In some cases, you know, somebody may ask, "Well, I need a, a, a an accessible parking spot," and the multifamily unit already has a uh, multiple um, spots that are designated as accessible parking. And so this person may be asking for an additional one. Well, that would then require, if you're going to do it legally, if you're going to do it the way it's supposed to be done, that would require some tearing up of the sidewalk and doing another ramp and marking up the uh, parking spot. And so depending on how much that costs, that might be an undue financial and administrative burden. And remember that there are, were already regulations stipulating how many um, accessible parkings were needed or required as part of the construction of the, of the, of the multifamily uh, unit. So in those particular cases, you know, they've already met the standard, right? And so now they have to meet another standard or they have to meet a, a, an accommodation. And this is where, you know, many times we'll say, even if you have another accessible parking, it doesn't necessarily mean that that parking is assigned to you specifically. Anyone that is disabled can park there. And so many times what you see happen is there may be a negotiation where it's the closest parking available or the closest one to the unit that is available. And then they would probably put a sign that says, assigned to apartment so-and-so. And in that particular instance, that parking is designated for that individual. And it happens a lot more on uh, a multifamily properties that don't have assigned parking spots. It makes it a lot easier. To, to do that, to be able to come up and say, okay, well, they need a parking spot so that they can walk the least distance to their unit. It would be this parking spot. And so we're going to go ahead and, and establish the sign here. So that's how that happens. And then a housing provider that does not receive federal funding, they don't have to pay for it, um, you know, but they, uh, they would have to permit the tenant 
to make the modification at their expense. So they can't come up and say, no. They say, well, you know, if you're gonna pay for it, absolutely, if I can have it put back to the way it was before it was modified, absolutely. And one of the selling points, at least in my past career has been, then why not just come up and say, well, listen, if this is not going to change the way you do business and it doesn't change the aesthetic of your, of your building, do you see value in maintaining this accessible feature, right? Uh, and it becomes something that that is part of your your daily business. And some some property managers will will accept that. Uh, other private landlords, I think, are a little more reticent to doing that. But uh, that's something that I've always encouraged um, in my past career. It's like, listen, this modification looks professional. Um, it becomes another selling point for you when you are uh, seeking your next tenant, and you can say with accessible features or what have you. Um, so that is that, yeah, the computer here is giving me attitude, pardon me. There we go. Continuing with buildings uh, covered, let's, uh, again, it's buildings built for first occupancy after March 13th, 1991. You've heard me say first occupancy a couple of times. Uh, which follow they follow they fall under the definition of the covered multifamily dwellings. All dwelling units in buildings containing four or more dwelling units, if it if such buildings have one or more elevators and all ground floor dwelling units in other buildings containing four or more units. Little technical jargon jargon straight from the guidelines. Basically, it just means that you know if they were built for first occupancy after March 13th, 1991. And those, those of us that are in the enforcement realm here, one of the first questions that we will ask in a uh, accessible design question is when was it constructed for first occupants? That's the first, one of the first questions that should be asked. When was it constructed for first occupancy? And granted, you're not gonna get that probably from the intake interview. You're probably gonna get that through investigation. And that's one of the first questions that we wanna ask is, you know, and I say this because I know there are a lot of enforcement folks on here, uh, but that's one of the things that we would ask is when was this building constructed for first occupancy? And was this building intended for other than occupancy when it was first built, right? Because if it was intended for something else and not for first occupancy, they may not have to uh, adjust. Um, and we'll get on into that in a little bit. Talking about uh, dwellings covered, I, I put a, a list here. There might be more uh, on the list, but condominiums, certainly single story townhomes, vacation timeshare units, um, college dormitories, apartment housing in private universities, sleeping accommodations intended for occupancy as a residence in a shelter and continuing care facilities or retirement homes. And again, this is not an exhaustive list. It gives you an idea uh, of those and, and the one thing that you can see here is obviously it's buildings that are meant to be occupied as residences. It's the continuing theme here. Are there exemptions to the Fair Housing Design requirement? The Fair Housing Act does not require any renovations existing to existing buildings. Its design requirements apply to new construction only, to covered multifamily dwellings that are built for first occupancy after March 13th, 1991. First occupancy is defined as a building that has never before been used for any purpose, right? A building that has never before been used for any purpose. So the only purpose that building was, was built for was occupancy and it was after March 13th, 1991. And, uh, this is where we get into a little bit of the design requirements. And uh, I just wanted to give you a broad idea because this gets a lot more technical. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot for those of you that are in the enforcement space, things that you have to look at, but I wanted to give everyone kind of a top level view. So when you look at this accessible building entrance, this is one of the design requirements. There are about seven, seven main requirements. And so this is one of them. This is accessible building entrance on an accept, accessible route. I wanted to start at the parking because I always start at the parking, right? 
And you can actually start at the sidewalk and say, are there ramps that allow people to come off the main sidewalk, right, a, a throughway, onto the sidewalk that goes to the property? And I've seen buildings that were built after 1991 that have steps to their, to their uh, throughway uh, and no ramps. And, uh, and they've gotten away with it for years, but it's still, you know, I won't say where it is, but I, I see that. Um, so covered multifamily dwellings must have at least one building entrance on an accessible route, unless it is impractical to do so because of terrain or unusual characteristics of the site. For all such dwellings with a building entrance uh, on a accessible route, the following six requirements apply. So this is the first requirement that we're going to go into. Now, what I've shown you here, I started at the parking lot, and you can see there's a 96-inch minimum uh, parking space, right, for accessible parking. And then you have a uh, five or six, five or, I can't, I can't read, five or eight uh, for, for van access, right? Uh, and then you have your curb cut, you have your marked, uh, access aisle as well. You have your curb cut ramp that gets you onto the sidewalk and then it lets you. So that's where the, this is where in this particular instance, if you're driving, this is where your accessible route begins. It begins with having the right uh, required parking spot, the access um, that is marked, as well as the ramp to get you on the sidewalk. And then, of course, you have the sign. Uh, with the international symbol of accessibility. Okay, go on to the next one. Second requirement, accessible and usable public common use areas. Uh, and so the public and common use areas must be readily accessible and usable by people with disability. So once again, if you look at the image that I put on the right, you can see where the parking, remember I said, this is where your accessible uh, your accessible route begins. So you can see down here toward the center left portion of the of the picture, you'll see that there's an individual that is making their uh, exit from the van into the marked aisleway. And then you'll see the shaded area that basically depicts the unobstructed um, route, accessible route to all portions. So you, they can they can take that route to the front door. Uh, which is powered, and they, they can also use the accessible throughway there to get to the bus stop. So that's that's the accessible route. It's unimpeded. It's accessible, easy to get to. It's got the right requirements. It's got the marked paths for uh, egress and entrance into the building. Usable doors is another requirement, the third requirement of the Fair Housing Design Act. It's uh, all doors designed to allow passage into within all premises must be sufficiently wide to allow passage by persons in wheelchairs. Now, this is a building obviously that was built for first occupancy after uh, March 13th, 1991. And you can see the powered uh, button there for the door and it opens the door and it's certainly wide enough for a person to walk through. Uh, I'm sorry, to traverse through. Uh, and so that becomes, that looks like a requirement that is met. Uh, and this is one of the things that if you're doing enforcement and you're doing an accessible design uh, inspection, you, you could look at that when you're, when you're uh, on site. You know, how high is the button? Is it easy to get to? Is there a bush in front of it? And, you know, are there any uh, trash cans in front of it blocking its view? All of these things matter because people need to be able to walk unobstructed and, and traverse unobstructed into and out of the building. Accessible route into and through all co the covered dwellings. So no image on this one, because you can see that if you started your path from the van and you're in a wheelchair or motorized uh, conveyance and you're, and you're using the, the road, it gets you into the door, you're into the lobby. Uh, you've now gone through the lobby and now you're going into the elevator. The elevator should be wide enough that a person can get their, their uh, the motorized conveyance in and they should be able to go up to their desired floor, be able to exit the elevator. The, the hallway should be uh, wide enough for a person to traverse through and be able to use uh, 
and get to the door. Then when they get to their unit door, that door should be wide enough for them to traverse through and to be able to uh, uh, get into their unit. And then once you get into your unit, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but once you get into their unit, you know, after having that accessible route into and through the dwelling, you need to have be, uh, access. So it should be accessible through all common areas, to the elevator, to the hallways, to the doorways, et cetera. And then once you're in your unit, if it's not outfitted in a manner that allows an individual to enjoy the dwelling as anyone else, that's where reasonable accommodations and reasonable modification must be made. That's when they can request it. That's when it can be made. So it might be that they may lower, they need to lower the counters. They may need to lower the light switch. They may need to widen doorways. They may need to put uh, grand bars. So not to get ahead of myself, we'll go on to the next one. Pardon me. Uh, again, this thing is giving me attitude. Okay. Another design requirement of the fair housing that the light switches, electrical outlets, thermostats, and other environmental controls. This again, uh, on the right, you see a picture that is, is depicting what the tolerances are. And I wanted to put this in here because without this, I mean, what good is this webinar if I don't put some of this in here? But all premises within the dwelling units must contain light switches, electrical outlets, thermostats, and other environmental controls in accessible locations. So you can see that there's a tolerance of 10 to tw uh, 24 um, inches. I mean, I got to move something out of my way here, uh, which is ma the maximum. So you don't want somebody overreaching that they would tip the wheelchair over. This is why these tolerances exist, right? Uh, and then you have a, a height of maximum height of uh, 46, 46 inches max. And any obstruction or anything in front of that should be no higher than 34 inches maximum, right? Sometimes there's a counter, there's a piece of furniture, there's, uh, you know, depending on where you're at, if you're in a common space, or if you are, um, um, as I mentioned earlier, coming in and they want to have a flower pot, well, that flower pot should not be uh, higher than 34 inches so that the person has access to what they need. Design requirement under the Fair Housing Act, this one is reinforced walls for grab bars, right? So they're building a building. They know that they're going to possibly have some people that may require a reasonable modification in installing a grab bar. And maybe in this particular unit, it's not being designed to be accessible. But under the, the, the guidance, they need to reinforce the walls. And I wanted to show you the picture. Uh, where these uh, two by sixes are, are being located and they're being located so that they can actually be reinforced for future installation of grab bars around the to uh, toilet and the shower stall and shower seat uh, where, where it's provided. So that's what this picture, this is a shower, um, appears to be a, a roll-in shower or, or standing shower. <laughs> Usable kitchens and bathrooms is another design requirement. And again, you know, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, there's, there's a lot of apartments that don't have this feature or don't have that feature. Remember that any building built for first occupancy after March 13th, 1991, okay? So uh, in, in the dwelling units must contain usable kitchens and bathrooms, such as an individual who you uses a wheelchair can maneuver about the space. And so there's, a, this one's pretty tight as far as galley kitchen is concerned, but it meets certain tolerances. If you look over on, uh, on the left toward the wall there, there seems to be a spot where an individual with a disability can probably roll their uh, wheelchair underneath and do a T-turn, okay? Uh, but certainly doesn't have the, the 60 inch radius to do a, a complete turn. And so there needs to be a space under the counter where it would allow for a T-turn, uh, like a three-point turn. And so that's what you see there. It would be to, to the back of the individual in the, uh, in the wheelchair. You also notice that these counters are at a height that is comfortable for that individual to be able to maneuver and to work on the stove and, and that kind of thing. 
So I wanted to put this in here. Uh, it, it's important uh, when we start looking at, you know, what dwellings are covered. You, you heard that there were some exemptions in there, but I want to remind you that there are no exemptions to the advertising clause of the Fair Housing Act or the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act. There are those phrases that do violate the advertising provisions of the PHRA. And so, you know, things like adult atmosphere, mature adults prefer, great for retired couple, great for couple just starting out, no kids, perfect for empty nesters, couples only, separate building for adults, young professionals, you know, and there are, there are then those phrasings that may not violate the PHRA, but do have, uh, let's call it disparate language. For example, you know, you have a beautiful unit with a, with a view. Um, you know, again, if you have somebody that's sight impaired, uh, things like walk-in closet, again, they may not violate, but, you know, neutral language is the best way to go about these things because people read into interpretations just like you could read into an interpretation when you look at these discriminatory statements, surround yourself by Christian neighbors. Well, that would lead you to believe that you, you probably aren't welcome if you're, person, if you're a person that is not Christian per se, if you're of another faith, or if you have no faith at all, you may feel that you're not welcome because of what's being said in the ad. And so even though, um, even though it's not meant to be discriminatory, there is a proof element, and those of you in enforcement know there's a proof element within HUD that's called futile gesture. And if you look at an ad from a particular housing provider that always has this type of language, then you may be dissuaded from applying. And in may, many cases, when you do not apply, that's enough to, to find like no probable cause on a case. However, futile gesture is, well, I knew they were discriminatory by the way they did their ad, and therefore I didn't bother to apply. So that's, that's how that works. And I just wanted to include that in there. Obviously, uh, things that do occur to individuals with disability, refusing to sell, lease, finance, or otherwise withhold housing or commercial property, you know, uh, and here's some of the, the examples, but some of the more recent examples that I've heard is, well, I don't think this unit's gonna be good for you because it's got stairs and I, I see you, you, you walk with a cane. We've heard that. And that is not a decision that, that a housing provider should make and nor is it a statement they should be making. Okay. And then of course you see that there are other examples there. Some discriminatory terms and conditions are other ways. Yeah, uh, other ways that people are discriminatory, uh, discriminated against. Um, they, they'll put fees in because the person does have a wheelchair and it's hardwood floors. And so they want to put some fees in to protect themselves from any damage caused by a wheelchair. Well, no, that's not allowed, right? It's almost as if you said, well, this person's got a ESA and I know that uh, the animal will probably uh, do some damage. So let me, let me go ahead and add a couple of extra provisions to the lease can't do that, not allowed. And continue with discriminatory terms and conditions, discriminating provision of facilities, services, or privileges connected with ownership, occupancy, or use of housing, commercial property. I, I just, you know, I, w throughout this, this presentation, we have peppered in with the fair housing language, the language of our act, because our, our act is very broad in scope. And I love the, the use of connected with the ownership, occupancy, or use of housing. And that's important because many times we hear a landlord, they'll fire back and they'll say, well, that person isn't even on the lease. That doesn't matter under the act. Under the act, ownership, occupancy, or use of housing is covered. Okay. And so many times uh, you'll find that somebody that maybe moved in uh, and is living with, say, their, their children, you know, for an extended period of time because maybe they have a temporary disability and they need to use a wheelchair and they need some care. And so the easiest way is to have them stay with their, with their uh, children and be looked after. And then you have these scenarios where someone wants to charge more. That's where you hear someone say, well, you know, they've got this person in there and so I want them to fill out a lease 
I want them to pay for an application fee and the whole nine yards so we can do a screening. Yeah, we need to keep an eye on that because that's just a way for someone to be othered, excluded, denied. Making discriminatory inquiry a record related to a protected class in connection with sale, leasing, or financing. And again, this is somebody, you see examples there like asking if someone has a disability on a mortgage application. No need to know that. No need for that. Right? Inquiring, well, you know, uh, or, or just making comments. It's like, yeah, I don't think this is the place for you because, you know, our building isn't, isn't um, accessible. You know, again, the refusal to deal is also covered. And of course, steering, attempting to induce listing, uh, sale, or otherwise transaction, or other transaction, or discourage pur purchase or lease by making direct or indirect references to present or future protected class composition of the neighborhood. And, the, and in our particular case, it's, it's about the steering away from units and using the language that, well, we don't, we don't have accessible features. Well, there is a thing called, a provision called the reasonable modification, reasonable mo accommodation. So when they're coming up and saying to someone, we're not accessible, what you're actually saying is no, you're denied, right? That, that's what they're saying. Because if they know that they, there are provisions within the law that allow a person with a disability to make the necessary uh, request for a reasonable accommodation, then that they should be uh, negotiating in good faith. So uh, disability related complaints made up about 48% of all housing complaints received in, in PA. I've got to check that number. I think it's a little higher and we'll update that for you. But that was uh, from 2019 to 2020. So obviously we get a lot of disability complaints um, and again, we talked about accommodation and reasonable modification for, for those of you that might be new to this and don't know the difference between the two. The reasonable modification is a structural change made to the premises. So you, say, you saw the, the ramp example, uh, installing a ramp, installing um, uh, grab bars, installing or exchanging a doorbell for a strobe light for those that may be hearing impaired. Um, would be a reasonable modification. Whereas a reasonable accommodation is a change, exception, or adjustment to a rule, policy, or practice, or service. Like the rent must be paid on the first, and if I don't receive it after the fifth, you're going to get a $50 per day late fee. A person receiving income because of their disability may not receive their income until after the fifth. And therefore, it would be totally reasonable for that person to ask for an accommodation to be able to pay that rent without suffering lay fees on a date after the fifth. That is a reasonable accommodation. Refusing uh, to make reasonable accommodations in rules, policies, practices, or services necessary to afford equal opportunity for a person with a disability to use and enjoy accommodation. Some of those examples you can see there, not allowing a person with a disability income to pay their rent on a different day or not allowing a person with disability to have a service animal when there is a no pets policy, which is another reasonable accommodation. And then of course, you know, for modification and changes, again, those modifications and changes are being paid for by the tenant unless the housing provider is receiving federal funds. Then they would be required to make those modifications. So not allowing a tenant to install grab bars in the bathroom in a unit that is not funded by federal uh, funds, if you don't allow it, then that is, that is uh, discriminatory. That would be a violation. If uh, the uh, not allowing a tenant in a wheelchair to construct a ramp, again, they're going to pay for it. They've asked for this reasonable modification. Not allowing it could violate the Fair Housing Act and the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act. And of course, we talked a little bit about the service uh, animals. Uh, it's not a choice, it is a right, it is a necessity to support animals. And I know that many housing providers believe that the laws on ESA are very broad in scope. They are indeed uh, broad in scope. Um, however, until that changes, 
you know, there are some modifications that have been made to HUD regulations, and I, I would invite you to look at HUD regulations uh, for January 28, 2020, where they talked about um, the emotional support animal and how the notifications from a medical professional uh, should be, come from somebody that has firsthand knowledge of the individual's disability. The PA law is more liberal than the federal law. That is true. Uh, it's not just dogs that are included in, in emotional support animals. And, and again, you're like, well, we're talking about accessibility. Why are we talking about emotional support animals? Because all of these are, are part of the enjoying the dwelling portion. This is the reason you do reasonable accommodation. It's the reason why you do reasonable modifications. And in this particular case, for someone to be able to enjoy their dwelling, it may be necessary for them to have an emotional support animal because without it, they may you know, suffer from depression, they may have panic attacks, they may have other conditions. So what's the difference between a support and service animal? Service animals generally trained to perform a specific task, like they pull a wheelchair and they're providing mobility support. Remember what I told you? That you needed to have at least 32 inches for someone that may uh, be using a service animal, right? You need to have that tolerance. You need to be able to have a, a hall wide enough for a service animal and an individual to walk through. Guiding individuals with uh, vision impairments, detecting and alerting individuals, oncoming seizures is another one. Support animal may not have any special training, then that's the difference. But an emotional support animal is there to alleviate an individual's anxiety, reducing an individual's depression, keeping an individual calm making an individual feel safe. And where is this more important when we're talking about, uh, when we're talking about a building? It becomes important when you're living in a multifamily building and you're someone that gets startled easily by noises. If you have an emotional support animal that can keep you calm, then it makes life worth living for that individual. So some of the things that we all take for granted are things that some of these emotional support animals are there to help with. Housing providers' rights. This is usually about the time where housing providers say, I don't have any rights. Sure you do. When you are presented with a request regarding a service or support animal, a housing provider can ask two questions. Does the person seeking the use uh, to use and live with the animal have a disability? Does that person have a disability-related need for the animal? If the answer to the question is yes, then you have to approve the accommodation. Now, a housing provider can ask, for proof of need, but not a tenant's actual medical condition. They can ask for a medical note of need. It doesn't need to be from a primary physician though. And this is something that I've seen as well in many cases where someone says, yeah, they gave me a note, but it wasn't from a doctor. You know, So those kinds of things uh, are what seem to occur and, it, and it's a delay tactic. And of course, we all know, those of us that do enforcement, we all know that uh, under the HUD proof guidance, it says that a delay is a denial. So a housing provider can deny the individual's request if documentation is not provided in a reasonable time. They can deny the individual's request if specific assistance animal poses a direct threat to the health and safety of others. Can't be speculative. You can't say, well, that emotional support animal, that's a pit bull or that's a Rottweiler. That's, that's a, an aggressive breed. No, we can't have that. No, that's speculative. And you can't have that. There's no restriction on breeds. Deny the individual request that the animal would cause substantial physical damage to the property. If, if an animal, if an emotional support animal is causing physical damage to the property, when you are talking to your resident, make sure you're talking about the damage to the property and not the emotional support animal. That's the one bit of advice I'm going to provide. That's a freebie. Focus on the violation not on the cause of that violation. They can require that all individuals with animals follow state and local regulations, such as requiring licensing and vaccinations, issue violations if the animal's conduct violates the rules, and hold a tenant responsible for the, uh, if the animal causes physical damage to the housing unit. All of those are reasonable. What they can't do is put limits on breeds or impose weight limits. Even if the property has these restrictions for pets, they must be waived for service and emotional support animal. Can't charge a pet fee, rent, or require additional security deposits, as, as I spoke earlier about that. 
And then accessibility as far as parking, it is unlawful to construct new housing or commercial property that isn't accessible for people with disability. Owners are required to make reasonable modifications to existing buildings so that they can be accessible. So here's some of the potential remedies uh, that, that uh, can be sought. Like if somebody is asking for a reasonable accommodation, then the reasonable accommodation would be met. A reasonable modification would be met if we found uh, probable cause or if we were conciliating a case. Um, you know, there might be some policy changes. Uh, pet policies maybe uh, might be changed. There would be civil penalties. Not that they can be, there will be civil penalties. Um, posting of housing notices, that's a requirement. Uh, training for the respondent, certainly. I think that these are, that particular one, the training for a respondent or for, for the housing provider, it's actually a benefit. It makes a better, uh, it makes a better landlord, it makes a better property manager. And you can see some of the other possible remedies there listed. Here's some of the re recent uh, awards, 1.5 million housing provider failed to provide accessible units and ignored requests for reasonable accommodations for tenants with disability. That's the one that I wanted to highlight for you, right? Another one that I could highlight for you is the HOA that refused to sell a condo in a 55 and over, older community to a man with disabilities and his wife after they asked for a reasonable accommodation of having their daughter who is under the age of 55 live there. She was going to be their uh, caregiver. Okay, there's my information. Uh, please uh, take it down or, or uh, you know, take down the, the email. If you have any questions, concerns, comments, complaints, you can always give me uh, an email. I didn't put my phone number because I don't, I don't do good on the phones. I, I do try to answer my calls, but I'm better on the email. Those emails get answered within 24 hours, guaranteed. And for now, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up for, for questions. I know that it went a little longer than expected, but I wanted to make sure that I gave you uh, as much information as possible. So please feel free to come off of mute. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and then I want to remind you, I also want to remind you that after you log off, uh, the survey is going to come up. Please fill that out uh, because I do look at those surveys. We do track those surveys just as a general way that we do our work. We track it so that we can go ahead and make a better training next time we come out, okay? So I, I have a question in the chat. What about landlords who state their insurance won't allow certain breeds? You know, um, that is a, I can tell you as a former uh, insurance agent myself, uh, I worked both as an underwriter uh, and I also worked in the sales end. So as an underwriter, there are questions that you would ask about any breed. Has that animal been trained to perform security services? And has that animal bitten anyone in the last two years? The absence of a yes response to those questions um, would basically determine a lower premium. The, uh, uh, the, the yes to either of those questions would then minimize the liability coverage or eliminate the liability coverage altogether. So when they say my insurance won't allow certain breeds, what they're really saying is that the, the insurance agent probably said, if you have these breeds, we're probably not gonna cover you for liability. We're gonna cover you against peril, fire, burglary, damage, you know, those kinds of things, but we're not gonna cover you for being sued on the liability end. So that's what they're saying. Uh, and so what I would, I would I advise that landlord is, shop around for another insurance company. There are insurance companies out there that will, will insure you regardless of breed, but it will affect your premium. In other words, you may pay a higher premium um, for certain breeds. Uh, I got another question. What if the breed, that breed is your ESA? Again, because that breed is your ESA, and thank you for that question, because it does draw a bold line there. And that bold line is it's an emotional support animal. If you have documented uh, notice from your insurance company saying, I'm not going to insure you because of your ESA, that's probably one that any one of the enforcement people on this call would love to have and be able to, uh, to investigate because that would be discriminatory. Uh, 
Any other questions? Uh, if you want to come off of mic uh, or if you want to type it in, I'll certainly look at it. Uh, I don't want to keep you longer than I should, but. Uh, I had a question. Um, I'm just wondering about the PHRA language about service animals and training. I know, like, and I'm just seeking some clarification. It looks like in like 2018, that was made to be a little bit more inclusive. Like maybe previously it was the animal had to be in training through a certified organization and now it does not. Can you just clarify that briefly? I would have to look more deeper into language, but what I can tell you is that when it comes to service animals. Service animals are trained for a particular task, and they are trained, let's say, around here, United Disability Services does training of service animals uh, in Lancaster County, as, as do others throughout the Commonwealth. And so service animals that are designed, that are trained to do a particular task, are going to be certified. Emotional support animals, that's where the broadness is, aren't necessarily trained. They, they don't have to be trained, emotional support animals. But service animals are the animals that will be, will be accompanying a person when they go to public spaces and uh, not only their apartments or their homes, but they also go to restaurants and hotels and so on. And those are usually allowed under the ADA and the ADA is restrictive as to what type of service animal. So you may not have a, for example, um, a service animal that might be an alligator, for example, may not be allowed, right? But they they limit it to pony, a uh, small pony, and uh, and dogs under the ADA, under the Fair Housing Act, the emotional support animal. There is no breed restriction. Right. No, thank you. And I know service animals and training are in that sort of odd category where they're not covered under the ADA, but the access is granted by state law. And that's, again, I was just sort of, I'm actually, I'm a disability services coordinator at a college. So I, the service animals and training are this very odd category that's sort of betwixt and between. Um, could you provide, is there like a resource or somebody who might be able to follow up on that issue specifically? Sure, if you want to put your email in the chat for me, uh, or I can give you my email address if you didn't take it down from the slide. Sure, I did take it down, so that would be okay. wonderful. I'll follow up yeah. in writing. Thank you. Do so. Thank you. Anyone else with a question? A lot of uh, enforcement folks on here. I can't believe they don't have a question. I can call on you. But I won't do that. Uh, Lyle, there, anything you want to share? Oh, there's, there's Zulai. Oh, I didn't have a question, but I wanted to know whether or not you saw the question that hearing examiner Hamurka put in the chat. Oh, I didn't see that. Let's see. She asks, what if there are different types of ramps or shower handles? Who gets to decide which type is reasonable? That Remember that the person asking for the reasonable modification is the tenant. And so the tenant can can discuss that with uh, with the landlord, and they can also provide a note from their medical professional, um, because there are, for example, on door latches. You'll notice that those accessible doors they all have the latches. They don't really have the the cylinder the cylinder style uh, handle for that very purpose. You want to be able to to use something that that is uh, viable for someone with a disability that may have manual dexterity issues. Uh, and so, but that would be something that the person asking for the reasonable modification could ask uh, and say, here's the type that I need for my disability. And again, that's part of the reasonable modification request. That answers that question. That sounds good to me. Right. I saw Lyle coming off of there as well. Did you have something to add, uh, Director Wood? Hi, how are you doing, everybody? Um, the only thing is, is I, I would say, and I think that uh, Director Garcia did a fabulous job in pointing out some of the uh, uh, complexities uh, of, uh, of this kind of situation. Um, and just remind everybody that these cases are generally, generally uh, case by case. Um, some are very complex. Some are very simple and straightforward. Uh, and some of the, the more you know, recent ones I've gotten questions on are, are regarding emotional support animals in a public accommodation setting, uh, particularly uh, places where 
food is served, uh, restaurants, um, those can be kind of uh, tricky uh, types of cases to look at. But again, it falls back on the, the same need for that person with disability uh, to have, use, and enjoy the accommodation, whether it be a public accommodation or a housing accommodation, uh, the same as any person without uh, a disability. Uh, so um, Director Garcia is probably the most um, eminently qualified person that I've, I've worked with uh, with regards to this, but they, it can be complicated. It, it's not simple. Uh, and, 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 I'm, and one thing that does happen an awful lot, particularly in the housing context, is you have landlords who will say, and this is large property management companies down to your small, small mom and pause, my property, I'll do what I want with it. And to a degree, that's true, as long as it's not discriminatory uh, in terms of their behavior or violation of the act. So if, if any anybody, any, any of your clients, any of your contacts, any of your um, you know, uh, stakeholders have any questions on that, they should really give us a call uh, so that we can discuss it. And if it appears if there's been a violation, you know, we're more than happy to, if it's timely, jurisdictional, um, and they're standing, we're more than happy to take that complaint and prosecute it if there is a violation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, R.D. Wood. I really appreciate that. I appreciate your comments as well. It was it was tricky, and I want to apologize to uh, Ms. Canales. Uh, she, she was waiting out there in the waiting room, and I was not able to see to admit her. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> we'll, do, we'll do better uh, as we move forward uh, on these trainings to keep an eye on our waiting room. Uh, but... Uh, I did. It was a struggle to kind of choose all the elements that I thought would would be thirty thousand foot level because this is a wormhole that you could go into and never come out of. Um, but uh, I'm glad that you all were able to attend. I'm hoping that this was uh, helpful for you as an introduction to accessibility. I also want to acknowledge uh, by providing the correct name for our our ASL professionals, a uh, deaf and hard, uh, hard of hearing or deaf hearing interface. Um, I said deaf and hard of hearing services, which is incorrect. It's deaf hearing interface that are joining us today and providing the, the ASL, as well as the captioning. I want to thank you so much for that assistance. Uh, and let's see here. I'm about to cut it short because I know that time is fleeting and you all have many, many things to do. I want to make sure that there are no other questions. Thank you all. There are no other questions. Remember to take that survey. Uh, have a great rest of your day and thank you for your attention today. Thank you very much, Mr. Garcia. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your help. Absolutely. Have a good day. You too.